very fact of state intervention to stabilize capitalism itself was a result of a very specific conjuncture in the post Second World War years, immediately after the war, where it appeared that the system had to uh, allow such an interference in its functioning if it is to survive. It's a very unique conjuncture in which, as I mentioned, there was a very serious socialist threat from outside, very serious working class threat from inside, and it is in that context that the system actually uh, made allowances which it normally would not have done. Two basic forms of these allowances were firstly decolonization, the very fact that the old empires were got rid of. Again, Winston Churchill was opposed to it, but on the other hand, decolonization became necessary. And the other was state intervention in demand management, because in the absence of that, the capitalist economies would again have sunk into the kind of depression which had prevailed earlier, because the depression was overcome because of the war, military expenditures on account of the war, and if military expenditures subsided, then once more the system would have got into serious problems of crisis, which was not to be permitted, because then it wouldn't have survived. So you had this situation of state intervention in demand management. Now, it worked for some time and worked very well. As I mentioned earlier, it was called the golden age of capitalism. Capitalist economies experienced unemployment rates were, which were lower than at any time in their history. In fact, in Britain, uh, unemployment rate was less than 2%. You actually thought that the system was had changed. In the United States, unemployment rate in the Kennedy years was less than 4%. So you have, you have very high levels of employment. If you have high levels of employment, then you also have high levels of demand, therefore high level rates of growth. There are a lot of investment. If you have high rates of growth, you have high rates of labor productivity growth. And in a situation where unemployment is low, workers' bargaining strength is high, you have high levels of real wage growth. And so you actually had a situation where, for the first time, there were substantial benefits that came the way of the workers too, on account of this boom in capitalism, which was called the golden age of capitalism. Now, one of the tendencies of capital, which I talked about earlier in the morning, is the tendency for capital to come into larger and larger blocks. You have centralization of capital, big capital taking over from small capital. You have pooling of capital through stock exchanges, banks, and so on. So you have capital emerging in larger and larger blocks. Paradoxically, that tendency of capital manifested itself throughout the post-Second World War period. How the United States was setting up bases all over the world. The United States was incurring expenditures in these bases all over the world. The dollar was considered to be a reserve currency for the world, as good as gold. In fact, under the Bretton Woods system, it was 35 dollars per ounce of gold. The price was fixed. It was like a gold standard. But only a gold dollar standard, not that all other currencies were convertible to gold. So, uh, because of this, everybody was holding on to dollars. And as a result, the US was literally sitting on a gold mine where it could spend any amount abroad, just print dollars, and people were willing to hold these dollars because they were as good as gold. As a result, huge amounts of dollars poured out of the United States, and then people wanted these dollars to be invested somewhere. A euro-dollar market came up, which basically dealt with all these dollars. And so the idea was that we must find, I mean, barriers to the investment of these dollars all over the world should go. Under the old Bretton Woods system, you actually had controls on capital flows. Capital was not free to move around between countries, particularly finance. So there was a pressure that we should now be allowed to have financial flows 
across countries. Europe allowed financial flows in the late 60s, Africa and Latin America somewhat later, and India has allowed it in the 1990s. Therefore, in some sense, the very fact of financial flows being allowed across the world was a reflection of these enormous accumulations of finance, which in turn was a part of the process of centralization of capital, capital coming into bigger and bigger blocks that Marx had written about. Now, once you have capital finance, which is mobile across borders, then of course, as I had mentioned in my last lecture, then of course it becomes very difficult for the nation state to have an autonomy because then if the nation state pursues some policies which finance capital does not like, they simply quit the country. So it is important for the autonomy of the nation state to pursue policies, whatever it thinks fit, that there should be an area from which capital should not be allowed to flow. In, in, in other words, freedom of capital, freedom of financial flows is inimical to the autonomy of the nation state. I, I hope this is clear because it's extremely important. Amartya Sen once had an idea, he, he called it control area. He said that basically if you want to have an autonomous nation state, then there must be a control area over which the rate of the nation state can run. Now you can have a control area only if finance can't just flow out of it because if finance flows out of it, then the state says something, then finance flows out, there's a financial crisis and therefore the state's actions get subverted. The state has to withdraw. Okay. So Therefore, you find that the capacity of the nation state to pursue policies of its own choice was greatly undermined by the freedom of financial flows that took place. And that, in a sense, put paid to the entire project of Keynesian demand management. Keynes was a very clever man. And so he had written an article in 1933 in a, a magazine called Yale Review, in which he had of course said that the state must intervene to have full employment, but he had also said for this to happen, you must, finance must be national. That if finance is international, then you cannot have it. So the moment you have a process of internationalization of finance, it can go from one country to another. In that case, obviously, the state then becomes a prisoner to the whims and caprices of finance capital. And this is exactly what happened in the period after that. One of the implications of this is that the state must not run a fiscal deficit or these days must not run a fiscal deficit more than 3%. In the Eurozone, 3% is the limit. In India, 3% is the limit. Nobody quite knows why 3%, but 3% is the limit. Under the gold standard, it was zero. You're supposed to have sound finance balancing budgets, but now up to 3% is allowed, but not beyond that. Now, you may ask the question, why is it that finance capital has always been hostile to states running fiscal deficits? I think that is one of the, that's one of the deepest questions in economics to which really there is no answer. One can perhaps find an answer of the following kind. But this has always been the case. Even in 1929, in Britain, there was a suggestion by Lloyd George, because already depression had started in Britain, that why don't we have a fiscal deficit for providing, I mean, for, for employment projects on which people, the unemployed, can be put to employment, and we pay them by printing money which is a fiscal deficit. And to that there was massive opposition from the financial interests in Britain around the city of London. Finance capital is always opposed to state activism except in its own interests. In other words, they don't mind the state acting in order to provide subsidies to financiers, in order to provide all kinds of concessions. But they are certainly opposed to state activism for enlarging the level of activity and particularly for running a fiscal deficit. Why are they so opposed? I mean, I think it's a very difficult question uh, 
to my mind there is no satisfactory answer the only answer which i can possibly give is the following that you know that that you ask yourself the question why is capitalist so why were the indian capitalists so opposed to the public sector you know, just ask yourself the question why are they so opposed to the public sector the public sector in india india never said that we are going to take over private enterprises so the fact that the public sector is there does not even mean that the public sector is going to encroach upon the t- domain of the private sector so why are they opposed to the public sector the existence of a public sector undermines the social legitimacy of capitalism that you actually say that if the government can run enterprises you don't need capitalists you know so so in 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 some sense the the legitimacy of capitalism gets undermined to the extent that you actually have public sector running enterprises so it becomes important for them to always argue and show that the public sector cannot run enterprises it becomes an absolute necessity now if that is the case similarly state intervention in demand management being essential for ensuring a high level of employment in capitalism accepting that proposition is an implicit acceptance of the imperfectness of capitalism because it amounts to saying the system is not good enough you need the state to run it you need the state to intervene to 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 make it run and if this is this is a general attitude if this is the true if 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 so if state intervention is seen as undermining the legitimacy of capitalism social legitimacy of capitalism you can imagine how much stronger this argument would be as far as finance is concerned because finance consists of as keynes himself said, had said of functionless in, in investors at least a corporate company i mean a, 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 a corporate house runs some enterprises the financiers don't run anything they're simply shifting money around from here and there making enormous amounts of capital gains now the point is that if if it undermines the social legitimacy of capitalism it certainly would undermine the social legitimacy of the functionless investor which what financiers are because financiers really have no function whatsoever they 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 don't run businesses they don't make any decisions about where to invest they simply shift their money around from one thing to another in order to make speculative gains so the whole business of finances opposition to state intervention is as i said is a visceral opposition it's 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 a, it's a kind of basic opposition which arises in my view because of an instinctive feeling that if you had substantial state sector substantial state enterprises even in a capitalist economy in that case their own position would be jeopardized now this is something which has been there all through as i said even in 1929 finance opposed uh, this now this opposition however is something which in a situation where finance is national state is a nation state the nation state can override the opposition of finance but if finance is international and the state is a nation state then the state cannot override this opposition and consequently the state becomes completely a prisoner to the whims of globalized international finance as a result a very peculiar thing happened you see that during the entire period of the so called golden rule uh, golden age of capitalism you did not have a single financial crisis why because there was very strict regulations on finance on the other hand you had high levels of employment but once the state begins to withdraw from this role of ensuring a high level of demand then how do you make sure that the level of demand remains high originally one i mean one obvious way that this is this is done is by stimulating bubbles that if you have if you have bubbles if you have speculative bubbles then speculative bubbles increase the level of activity in the economy why do they do that what is a speculative bubble typically suppose okay there is a basic distinction 
between enterprise and speculation. Now, what is the distinction? If I invest, suppose I buy Tata shares or, 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 or I kind of buy some shares or I kind of set up an enterprise and hold shares in it, I do so because I'm, I'm interested in the enterprise. If I hold shares for keeps, in, in other words, I, I, I hold it as, as, as a part of my uh, idea of setting up a productive unit and so on, then that is enterprise. We all know that. Speculation is when I have no interest whatsoever in the particular enterprise whose shares I am holding. I simply move from one thing to another. I keep shifting and, and, and that is speculation. When holding a claim on a particular unit, business unit, is not for keeps, it is only for a day, half a day, kind of, you know, one morning or two days or whatever. There the idea is that you have only a fleeting interest. You don't even know what the enterprise is. You don't care what it is going to do. All you care about is whether the share price is going to rise by the afternoon or not rise by the afternoon. If it rises by the afternoon, I buy it now and then I sell it in the afternoon. So, in a world like this, all financial markets, you know, one of the basic problems about all markets is that the market can never distinguish between speculation and enterprise. And of course, in financial markets, speculation is always very important because financial assets have very low carrying cost. You know, if I speculate in wheat, I buy wheat in the morning, sell it, at least for a day I have to store the wheat or, you know, for, for a month I have to store the wheat, I have to have some go down, rats are going to get at the wheat and so on. So that is what economists call carrying cost, you know, the substantial carrying cost in all kinds of other assets. In financial assets, there are no carrying costs. As a result, there are assets which are very prone to speculation. I can simply make a telephone call, in which case I have bought, and I can make another telephone call, in which case I have sold. So the point is that you know, there is no question of any carrying cost. So financial assets are very prone to speculation. Therefore, financial asset markets are dominated invariably by speculators because there are some, of course, who are interested in the enterprise, but there's an enormous amount of noise with speculators coming in and, 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 and buying and selling and so on. Uh, the fact that this happens also implies that suppose for some reason the price of a share or, 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 or the stock market as a whole is booming. We don't care whether the boom is justified or not justified. We don't even care whether the boom is going to collapse or not. We only care about whether it's going to collapse by the afternoon or not. Okay, I may be, I may know inevitably it's going to collapse at some point, but the only thing I'm interested in is, is it going to collapse before I sell or is it going to collapse after? If I can be confident that let's say in the two hours is going to rise further, then I buy it. Then I buy the share, it rises, I sell. As a result, you can have very substantial increases which take place in the stock market prices, as we know from India, even when we know that the so-called fundamentals, in other words, the, the, the company whose shares are rising may itself not be doing very well, but its shares can rise and rise and rise because of the activities of the speculators. Now, when that happens, then you have uh, a very peculiar thing, uh, namely that, you know, suppose... Suppose I hold some shares and their prices have shot up, okay? If the prices have shot up, then two or three things happen. The first thing that happens is that my wealth has increased. Maybe it will collapse tomorrow, as indeed has happened, but for the time being, my wealth has increased greatly. If my wealth has increased greatly, I feel wealthy, I go and consume more, okay? I, 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 I go and buy more goods, I, I buy a house, I buy a yacht, I buy a villa, whatever. So... There is a wealth effect because of which demand for real goods and services also goes up. Okay, so, so you have speculative demand, which is completely spurious jacking up of prices of all kinds of financial assets. But that in turn actually gives rise to an increase in the real demand for goods and services, 
because of this wealth effect. Likewise, if financial assets for some reason, their prices have increased, the stock market is booming. In that case, also the cost of borrowing tends to go down. If, if, if you can float uh, shares and so on, you can, you can get finance quite easily. So that tends to encourage a certain amount of investment as well. As a result, these speculative booms give rise to what Keynes again had called euphoric expectations. There's a euphoria about expectations and euphoric expectations then mean that actually there is an increase in the demand for goods and services, uh, which means that there is increase in employment. In the absence of government intervention through fiscal means, this is one way in which actually employment does get stimulated under capitalism through the generation of euphoric expectations and speculative booms. In the 1990s, there was similar, and, and, and these euphoric expectations are basically what we call bubbles because they are going to collapse because they have nothing to do with the basic fundamentals. Their prices are high because everybody expects the prices to rise and therefore they keep buying and therefore it keeps, keeps rising and so on. I mean, every, everybody uh, uh, keeps expecting it to rise, therefore it rises. Now, in the 1990s, you had in the United States, the leading economy in the world and what happens in the US affects the world economy as a whole, a, a bubble which arose which was called the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble basically gave rise to an increase in the prices of all these kind of, you know, units, uh, which in turn gave rise to very significant amount of employment and so on. When the dot-com bubble was collapsing, Alan Greenspan, who was then the chairman of the Federal Reserve, wanted to stimulate another bubble. And so what he did is that he actually brought down interest rates, promoted, I mean, you know, gave out easy credit, which brought about another bubble, which was the housing bubble. And when the housing bubble collapses, of course, there is now not enough of, um, I mean, interest rates have again been brought down. They, they're virtually zero in the United States. Long-term interest rates in the United States are 0.11%, which is virtually zero. So even though the interest rates have, have, have come down, immediately there is no bubble. After all, you can't hold a gun to somebody's head and, and, and say, have euphoric expectations. As a result, capitalist economies are now sunk in a very deep crisis with no immediate prospect of getting out of it because government intervention is out. Governments could intervene. Of course, now with globalized capital, one government would not intervene. The US alone would not intervene. But you may have, let's say, 10 governments getting together and having a coordinated fiscal stimulus. And therefore, governments could intervene and bring the world economy out of the crisis. But that's not allowed. Because, as I said, finance capital is completely opposed to state activism of that kind. So, so that route is out. The only route that is available is, of course, through the stimulation of another bubble for which all kinds of efforts have been made. But on the other hand, no such bubble is arising in the United States. In China, there was a property bubble which now has collapsed. And even in India... The stock market bubble which had been there earlier is no longer really being sustained at least at the same level. It hasn't collapsed to the same extent, but on the other hand, you are not having any euphoric expectations at this moment. So world capitalism now is without that, either without the support of the state or is not even, I mean, it may wait for until a new bubble arises, but until a new bubble arises, there's nothing that can be done and nobody can force a new bubble to arise. Why the current crisis is quite serious and is likely to persist uh, in, the, in, 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 in the forthcoming uh, years is that precisely in the era of globalization, two things have happened. First, I have already discussed, namely, that state intervention in demand management 
is something which does not happen anymore on the contrary the insistent is insistence is on austerity austerity means that fiscal deficit cannot be increased and since tax rates on the capitalists can't be raised basically the state can do nothing in order to get rid of the crisis the other thing however is that globalization has done is that now you have a lot of global mobility of capital throughout the history of capitalism you had a situation in which you know labor was never allowed to migrate freely let's say from india to britain or from india to us or from india to australia and so on or from china to all these places there was always and still is there still is and always historically has been very strict limits on labor migration but on the other hand capital was allowed to come and set up enterprises nobody ever prevented in the 19th century or in early 20th century british industrialists from coming and setting up textile mills in india or jute textile mills in india but for some reason they did not do that suppose they had done that because the wages here were much lower if they had used the same processes of production as they were using let us say in manchester or somewhere else and set up enterprises in bombay then the entire industry would have moved from manchester to bombay and consequently you would have a situation where let's say this dichotomy between a poor india and a rich england could to some extent have been reduced okay the reason why you had this develop underdeveloped dichotomy at all was because capital even though juridically free to move did not actually move while labor was not even juridically allowed to move and is still not allowed to move you can't freely migrate to america or britain or australia or something as a result the world was segmented there was one segment in which you had huge amounts of labor reserves they had been created by the deindustrialization of the colonial period very low wages huge amounts of unemployment underemployment disguised unemployment overcrowding of land etc and there was another region in which of course wages were much higher not only were they higher they even rose along with labor productivity what has happened in contemporary globalization is that labor is still not allowed to move but on the other hand capital is now much more willing to move from the united states let's states let us say to set up enterprises in china to set up enterprises in kind of malaysia or indonesia or vietnam or to set up or 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 or, or to outsource service sector activities to india taking advantage of the lower wages here as a result even though cap labor is not mobile capital in a sense is much more mobile from the advanced to the backward countries but what that basically means is that the world is no longer segmented it's, it's no longer split up into two and if it's not split up into two then the low wages here the huge amounts of unemployment underemployment disguised unemployment here also keep down the wages in the united states in united kingdom and so on because of the fact that the wages there can't rise because then capital would move to china to india to vietnam etc so the third world labor reserves are now not only keeping down third world wages they are also keeping down first world wages okay and in in fact stiglitz has got a finding according to which between 1968 and 2011 the real wage rate of a male american worker has not increased it has actually decreased in absolute terms okay therefore if you take the world as a whole i'm not saying that the real wages in america are now the same as in india of course not those differences persist but they're not rising so if you take the vector of real wages as more or less given okay but labor productivity is rising everywhere in the world okay as a result you have a situation where the proportion of economic surplus in world output is rising now whenever so, and and by the way a lot of the inequalities that people are talking about including piketty and so on this is happening inside countries this is happening even globally a lot of the inequalities that people like piketty and so on are talking about mm -hmm. 
arise precisely for this reason. Namely, now, all over the world, wages are kept down even as labor productivity is rising, which basically means the share of surplus and of those who live off the surplus, not just the capitalists, but others like lawyers and accountants and, and so on and so forth, business executives, etc., their salaries are increasing. So you have these inequalities taking place. But when such inequalities take place, you also always tend to have a following situation, namely that per unit income, the amount of consumption that the poor undertake is greater than the amount of consumption that the rich undertake within any given period. Okay. In other words, suppose there is a rupee which is given to me in that, I mean, okay, the rupee which is given to a poor man, that, that, that poor man would in fact probably spend it immediately. If there is a rupee which is given to a rich man, the rich man may spend it over a period of time, but in any given time period, the amount the person would spend is less than a rupee. Okay. As a result, any such income distribution <coughs> has the effect of reducing aggregate demand. Okay. This idea that a shift in income distribution in an inegalitarian manner from wages to profits, let us say, tends to reduce the level of aggregate demand, other things remaining the same, is referred to as underconsumptionism. You know, it's, it's the, the, it is called a theory of underconsumption. Now, if therefore at the world level now, what you are having is such a shift in income distribution which has the effect of keeping down aggregate demand at the global level and therefore of not just keeping down, reducing other things remaining the same, the level of aggregate demand because of a kind of global tendency. As a result, uh, the crisis is likely to persist because there are the structural reasons underneath it and it is not very surprising that despite the interest rate in the US, the long-term interest rate, which is what matters when it comes to investments, long-term investments, despite the long-term interest rate being almost close to zero, you still have a situation where the recession persists. In the United States itself, there is always much talk about recovery, but you, if you look at papers, they are forever saying that unemployment rate in the US has come down. But you see, in the US, large numbers of the workforce is simply dropping out of the workforce because there are not enough jobs. So the unemployment rate is calculated taking into account the workforce minus the discouraged worker effect. If you take the workforce to population ratio, what's called the work participation rate, which prevailed in 2007 before the onset of the crisis, on the eve of the crisis, Assume the same ratio today, then in the US you would get 11% unemployment rate today. Uh, official unemployment rate is 5%. That's because a whole lot of fellows have dropped out of the workforce because there is no, no possibility of getting a job. If you assume them to be in the workforce, which they are, because you know, strictly speaking, they are people who need the work, then the unemployment rate is 11%. The fact that you have this very significant unemployment rate persisting despite almost 0% long-term interest rate, which means monetary policy has run its course. You can't make monetary policy into negative interest rates. Okay, uh, Fiscal policy, not possible because of the fact that you have austerity. No policy, therefore, is now available to get these economies out of their crisis. Uh, you just have to wait for a new bubble to arise whenever it does. But in the absence of such a bubble, you actually would find that situation might actually become worse. And this is likely to be the case also because for a while, there was a property bubble in China, as I mentioned. That property bubble in China has collapsed, which is why Chinese growth rates are collapsing. With Chinese growth rates collapsing, China... Now, you see, so, so all of, you know, because of the persistence of 
the crisis, different countries then start struggling against one another for a larger output, which is, as I mentioned last time, beggar my neighbor policies. Now, I think the Chinese devaluation of the yuan was one example of this beggar my neighbor policy. But on the other hand, this is something which has given rise to devaluations of other currencies. And this kind of thing is likely to continue. And if it continues, uncertainties in the world market increase, investment falls further, and therefore you would have an even worsening of the kind of crisis. So, so when we look at the crisis today, I mean, I just want to link it up with what I said earlier, that basically the idea that you could, through polit putting politics in command, get rid of some of the structural features which we had known to be associated with capitalism, which was Keynes's assumption, which is a liberal supposition and which appeared to work for a while in the post-Second World War period for a couple of decades, is something which is not working because that was a period, in my view, an exceptional period when capital accepted all these restrictions upon its own predilections. But now you have a situation where once more, economics is driving politics. That means by economics driving politics, I mean the economic tendencies, the, 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 the kind of things that capital would like, the kind of economic regime that capital would like, the kind of economic regime that has typically always characterized capitalism within which capital has functioned, that regime has re-established itself and with its re-establishing once more, we, we have now a very serious tendency towards unemployment and crisis, which basically shows, in my view, that the liberal presumption that you can actually interfere with capitalism in order to reform it has now been shown to be something which was an exaggeration, excessive optimism. You see, basically, we have to look at two different kinds of impact of the world crisis on the Indian economy. One is the directly financial impact. India did not have much of a financial impact because in India, we had much of our banking sector was nationalized. The nationalized banking sector, at the time of the crisis, the total amount of foreign assets held by the Indian bank banks was about 7% proportion. Of the total assets they had, about 7% consisted of foreign assets. Now, all foreign assets are not toxic assets. Okay, So, the proportion of toxic assets was even smaller. And even this 7% was not so much in the nationalized in the big banks, but some of the other banks, smaller banks. ICICI, for instance, had a fair amount of foreign assets and so on. Those were the banks in whose case vulnerability was at all being talked about. But the bulk of the Indian banking system, particularly the big nationalized banks, state bank and so on, they hardly had any foreign assets. They didn't have much. As a result, it was, you know, India could absorb that financial shock very easily. Okay. But of course, where, so, so the financial system did not impact on India as much. Let me just go back a little bit. You know, we were discussing, we were discussing um, bubbles. Now, what happens in a bubble? What happens in a bubble, let us say, is that suppose, uh, you know, the price of the financial asset is high. I want to buy a financial asset. I want to buy it in order to sell tomorrow. Suppose the financial asset is, is, is 100 rupees and so I can go to a bank and then borrow a certain part, either the 100 rupees or a proportion of it from the bank and the bank will willingly give me a loan and I buy the financial asset. When the bubble collapses, Think of the bank, because as far as the bank is concerned, the amount it had given to me now has virtually zero value. So, so the bank becomes, becomes vulnerable because its assets go down drastically while its liabilities remain what they were. That's the cause of the financial crisis, namely the collapse of the bubble immediately affects the entire financial system because the entire financial system was complicit in building up these assets whose value now collapses relative to their liabilities. Okay. <clears throat> now, in India, because there was very little foreign asset holding, very little of these asset values collapsed, consequently, there was no problem at all. 
Okay. But on the other hand, the real crisis, because when this happens, I mentioned that a bubble increases aggregate demand. The collapse of a bubble also reduces aggregate demand. Naturally, when people are bankrupt, they cut back on their consumption. When, you know, no investment takes place, etc. Therefore, there's a fall in the aggregate demand, unemployment, world economy, uh, you know, generally gets into a recession, etc. All that is affecting the Indian economy. For 10 consecutive months in India now, exports have been going down in value in absolute terms last 10 months so and that's affecting china as well china immediately withstood this world capitalist crisis quite dramatically quite successfully because financially it was not much exposed and in terms of real sectors chinese exports did not suffer as much because china was a low cost producer and as i mentioned the domestic property boom kept up the chinese um GDP growth rate and of course they also had a fairly significant fiscal stimulus okay but now the fiscal stimulus is not being increased any further property boom has collapses and the world market recession is beginning to affect them so China's growth rate is falling exactly the same is holding as far as India is concerned so we were the victims of the real crisis not of the financial crisis they are the ones whose real crisis is linked to their financial crisis. So financial crisis, real crisis, no immediate impact, but impact of the real crisis on us. That's the way it is.